Welcome, everybody, to Radicalized Truth Survives podcast, episode 107. Hi-Fi and I will be interviewing Sean Norris today, our very good friend, investigative reporter and feminist author. Many of you have seen her on the show before. She's going to be explaining the network behind the recent rash of violence in the United Kingdom and why it's nice to have new governance that's quite competent. Have a listen. Sean Norris, we are so glad to have you back with us. So happy to see you. Um, I want to remind our friends, uh, we pretty much kicked off RadPod. Sean was in our first uh, first week of episodes. Um, I wanted to make sure people know about your book, Bodies Under Siege, which is very important and looks at the global assault on women's healthcare rights. Also, um, I want to direct people to your work at Open Democracy, where you have covered the violent extremism and great replacement theory in depth. And I'd like to kind of start before we broaden out, I'd love for you to start with sort of a personal snapshot from Bristol on what uh, things looked like a few weeks ago and then take us uh, through what your findings are on this recent rash of violence. Sure, so thank you for having me back on. Um, yeah, I can definitely start by talking about Bristol, where, where I live, but I, in order to do that, I need to give a little bit of context as to why this far-right violence erupted in the UK over the last couple of weeks. So a few weeks ago, there was a really horrific incident, um, a stabbing of little girls at a Taylor Swift dance class, which resulted in three little girls being killed. Um, really awful just I mean I couldn't even engage with the news reports on it because I just got so upset thinking about those children and and like how frightened and desperately you know terrifying it must have been for them and their families um but in the wake of these killings um there was disinformation being put out online particularly then amplified by far-right influencers which said that the person who was responsible for the attack was a migrant person who's arrived into the UK on a small boat, so crossing from France across the channel into the UK, and um, was Muslim. Now, as it turned out, the person who was eventually charged for these killings was a teenage boy from Cardiff of Rwandan heritage. He was not Muslim, he was not um, a migrant person, he was not someone who had come over on a small boat. But by this point, this disinformation had taken hold. And in there was a, a real kind of surge of, you know, anti-migrant feeling, very racist feeling about people coming over to the UK and causing violent attacks. So the little girls who were killed, they lived in a place called Southport. And after there was a vigil um, in remembrance of them, Southport kind of erupted into a riot. So cars were being set on fire. You know, there was a lot of violence, a lot of, um, you know, antagonism and hate going on. And this spread from town to town to town until on Saturday, just gone. So not the one that's not the day before yesterday, but the week before, um, there was sort of far right riots happening all over the UK, including where I live in Bristol. So Bristol is really known for being like a very liberal city, a very left wing city, really progressive. We're like a city of sanctuary when it comes to supporting asylum seeking people. Um, but that didn't stop a far right activist turning up in Castle Park um, in the centre of town. And for those who don't know Bristol, like Castle Park is um, really on a Saturday night, a place where lots of young people gather. Someone's always brought the guitar. There's always a sound system playing dub and reggae. People are smoking, drinking cans, like someone's juggling. It's a really kind of vibrant, young place. And it's also got a memorial plaque for the um, Bristolians who went and fought in Spain um, against fascism in the 1930s. So it felt very like prominent that the um, far right was coming here to this space. And, you know, we saw like groups of, of white men attacking black passersby. And then as the riot kind of progressed or the you know the sort of m moments progressed 
they went to a nearby hotel which was housing asylum seeking people and began to like protest outside there luckily they were met by a massive counter protest of people who support migrant rights the people who support refugees who almost created a human shield in front of the hotel to make sure that the far right protesters couldn't reach you know the asylum seeking people like people from afghanistan people from syria people from sudan who are staying in the hotel. And we can talk a little bit about why people are staying in hotels and what the kind of government policy around that is. So Bristol, it was pretty, it was pretty intense, but it was not as bad as other places in the UK. So in Rotherham in the Northwest, um, the far right set fire to a hotel that was housing asylum seeking people with, you know, people were in the hotel when they set fire to it. There were attacks against police officers, um, in other parts of the country, there was footage of Asian men and, you know, visibly, I'm going to say visibly foreign people and, and Romanian men being dragged out of their cars as men, like the far right were going, kill them, kill them. And as all of this was happening, you know, we saw the far right influences, the, the feeders of disinformation, the people who are fueling this hate, being very careful about what they tweeted, you know, skirting on that edge of not inciting violence, not committing the actual crime, but making sure that this disinformation and this hate was gathering pace and so that people were reacting to that information in, in these violent acts. And, you know, again, we can talk a little bit more about how, yes, the, the Southport killings were the inciting incident, but there's, a you know, been a long sort of run up into this to this point but it's it's been a very troubling few weeks but last week there was a kind of fear that the violence was going to erupt again on Wednesday um, but actually in Bristol what we saw was about 1500 pro-migrant pro-human rights pro-refugee people go out onto the streets um, in East Bristol in Old Market saying you know fascists are not welcome here, the far right is not welcome here, but refugees are welcome here. And the the violence and kind of protests from the far right that had been trailed didn't take place. And it was really a mobilization of, a, of progressive people who care about human rights taking to the streets instead. And that was reflected in London and in other cities across the UK. So a terrible time, but a glimmer of hope in that there are more of us, there are more of us who care about asylum rights than there are them. I think that's really important for American viewers to hear because too often we see these violent incidents that we've become sadly accustomed to and rather than show up in numbers to crush their presence, I think too many people kind of shirk back in fear and despair, which I think is absolutely the enemy of action. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about, you understand probably more than anybody, I'd say Hi-Fi and Jim uh, comparably, how people are radicalized in chat rooms, how these incels you know, are hatched in these various laboratories and the influence of the Andrew Tates and the Elon Musks and the fact that he's replatformed, formerly banned, uh, stochastic terrorists, as far as I'm concerned. And when you see an incident happen, and then you immediately track the language and the social media provocations around it, kind of what does that tell you from your, you know, area of expertise and, and studying extremism? So one of the things that I think is really important to understand about both these riots, but more on a broader scale than modern far right, um, is that we are looking at a networked movement. And I think this is something that the British, I don't want to say the British media, I'm in the British media, <laughs> that, that Britain has kind of struggled to understand. We, we've got a very traditional view of what the far right look like. It's men in back rooms of pubs, following a leader, having a ruckus. Um, and it's a very clear hierarchical structure. Um, but what we're seeing now is more of a networked online movement which coalesces not around a leading figure but around an ideology and the ideology is great replacement so you know your viewers are well versed in this but just in case great replacement theory is this idea that white people in the global north are being replaced by migrant people from the global south that this replacement is being aided by feminists who repress the white birth rate through abortion and contraception, and it's all being organized by liberal elites, aka the Jewish people. 
So, you know, as in all far right conspiracies, it often ends with the Jews. So I think um, this, this ideology is telegraphed around these networks. It's shared by kind of on Telegram channels, on Twitter, and sometimes it's shared in a really blatant way. So the, you know, organization Patriotic Alternative, which is one of the kind of more prominent far right groups in Britain, will often talk about, use the language of white genocide. It will have banner drops where it talks about replacement very explicitly. Um, but also what we see is language that refers or hints or winks at replacement. And I think this is what's been really interesting about the kind of language of these riots, which is often focused on save our children, save the children, bringing that kind of QAnon language into these race riots. Because when we think about it, children are on the front line of replacement in the far right mind. You know, this idea that a shadowy other, um, you know, a Muslim man, an LGBT person, a drag queen is coming to get your children, take your children away. And in, you know, worst cases, you know, sexually abuse or, or kill your children. It's this real fear of like, you are being replaced by these outside forces. And like, this is a white genocide against us, against our children, against our families. Obviously, it's all nonsense. Like there is no great replacement. There is no evidence of this kind of demographic change. And obviously, you, you know, these kind of racist um, and racialized conspiracy theories don't have any basis. But child abuse happens no matter what the color of the perpetrator's skin, for example. But I think one of the really interesting things that we've seen both in the last couple of weeks in the UK, but more broadly um, as in the sort of rising far right around the world is this ideology being pushed out there by influences. So rather than having hierarchical structures with a group leader, We've got these very like prominent social media influencers, thinkers, um, you know, for what they would call themselves philosophers, but I would dispute that term, um, who are putting out this messaging, who are constantly feeding this drip drip of like cultural Marxists are coming for your children, grooming gangs are coming for your children, the illegals are staying in the hotels and taking over our heritage. And again, it's very careful not to cross that line into inciting violence but it's creating an atmosphere of violence an atmosphere of threat and of course when you think of great replacement conspiracy theory as representing a white genocide which is what the far right believes then the only response to that is violence the only response to that is war is fighting is provoking a genocide of your own and so it's been really a formative example of what a lot of us have been saying for a long time and in some ways that means it hasn't been surprising but it doesn't make it any less shocking brilliant i have another question but hi fi you jump in um i i find the the riots in the uk are very interesting to me because there was another instance where social media uh, drastically fueled sectarian violence in 2020. And that was in Delhi, uh, resulting in the death of 59 people. Uh, there was a, you know, a, a Hindu versus Muslim fight set up on social media. Uh, exact same tactics we're discussing here. Social media influencers, no single leader, but things got out of hand. Um, how do you think now that uh, Starmer is in charge how do you think the uk government is going to respond to this utilization of social media uh, as an instigator for violence so i mean i think it's important to recognize that one of the reasons we probably had these rights is because starmer is in charge so for a long time we've had um right-wing conservative governments who've been increasingly anti-migrant anti-refugee who've increasingly courted the far right and sort of enacted policies that meet the demands and desires of the far right while again never actually being far right themselves um and now that we've got a labor government that has cancelled some of the more egregious anti-migrant policies i think the far right is like hold on a second we our we had these allies in power and now they've gone what are we going to do about it but that's an aside in terms of um how the government is responding i think 
Starmer was the former director of public prosecutions and he was the director of public prosecutions during the 2011 riots and very speedily locked a lot of people up. And he's been very criticized for that because it felt like um, in 2011, there was some really heavy handed um, justice, you know, people going to prison for stealing a water bottle from a, a shop during the riot. I mean, it is a crime, but do you, you know, there's a lot of control, like a discussion about how that went down. Um, but I think his real response has been like, we need to show that people are getting charged, convicted and sentenced for inciting violence, for taking part in riot violence, for, you know, engaging in these kind of hateful acts and for also for looting and destruction of property and assaulting emergency workers, things like that, um, in order to create a deterrent. So that's very much the position that the government is coming from at the moment, like swift justice that is harsh and deters people. And I'm sure in you know there will be discussions about whether that some of that was proportionate, um, whether that was the right thing to do. And people on like the sort of carceral and anti-carceral side of the left will have a, a ruckus about what the right response is, but that's where we are. But in terms of social media, I mean, as has long been, as is the case of I think many governments around the world, I don't think our government really gets it. And I don't think that, like I said, they're not unique in that. We're still really sort of, you know, like I said, thinking about the far right as this kind of hierarchical in-person movement rather than this networked movement. There's still a lot of catch up to do in legislation to understand how harm, harm can be spread via social media. And so we've got this thing called the online safety bill I can't remember if it's been passed as the Online Safety Act, but some of it hasn't been. Yes, uh, uh, it has. And there's some yeah. thinking, there's two schools of thought on that, that my friend Keir Giles thinks that it may actually have deterred some people from mewling hacked information because that mewling part now, there's, re there's a regulation gap that's been filled and you can mm. be prosecuted. So he thinks that he thinks that may have slowed some of what we often see, which is that foreign interference meddling uh, during our elections. And I can't believe I just used the word meddling. That's actually a tax. And certainly in America, it was an attack, not some little nuanced uh, noodling of margins. But our other friend, Dr. Charles Creel, who actually, um, you know, had a had played a role in, in, in the writing mm -hmm. and, and uh, implementation of that legislation, believes that since it's not properly funded, that it can't really be implemented. So I think you're right. You're still in that weird zone where it's like they're starting to make moves, but are they going to be, are they going to have enough Im impact? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the problem is tech moves so fast that legislation is constantly playing catch up. And the Online Safety Act has is it's controversial in lots of ways there's a lot of concerns about privacy and a lot of concerns about repression of freedom of speech um and again people will debate that and and have a discussion and around it but my concern at the moment is that it doesn't it can't reach the new threshold that is constantly coming out with how social media is operating and what we have at the moment is elon musk basically trolling the uk prime minister like in a completely bizarre way. And and what does the Online Safety Act do about that? It's a piece of British legislation. It can't touch Elon Musk for saying that civil war is inevitable in Britain. Um, and so I think there's a really, like every government in the world, not just in the UK, is grappling with this issue of how do we t challenge the tech giants? How do we protect freedom of speech? while also making sure that hate speech and incitement to violence isn't allowed to flourish on these platforms? How do we hold the people running these platforms to account when they're not in our jurisdiction? I mean, even, gosh, it was probably about 10 years ago now when like Mark Zuckerberg just refused to go to the tech select committee. And it's like, of course he did. He's a multi-billionaire living in California. He's not gonna go to like some drafty room in Westminster to like chat to some MPs. Um, you know, so it's like the power, the power mechanisms that exist do not feel robust enough and advanced enough at this point to really manage this level of disinformation and this level of online hate.
Yeah, I am thinking that there may be some hope uh, with the EU because it seems like they are uh, more uh, frequently than not making public statements addressing what is happening on Musk's uh, X Twitter platform. So I am hoping that some of this new legislation around our very, um, you know, urgent problems are going to start having some sort of incremental impacts. I, I hope it happens sooner than later. And we talk a lot about, uh, you know, the, the wording that kind of plays around the margins where they can still scream free speech when we know that it actually is part of a network, as you were saying, and the shooters that we have here in America, invariably we find that they've been in chat rooms being radicalized where maybe they weren't racist when they were 17, but something happened between 18 and 19 that made somebody go out and shoot a bunch of people uh, you know, in a supermarket. And we see the same thing over and over again. And in your work with Bodies Under Siege, where you showed how misogyny has been weaponized, can you speak a bit about the connection between misogyny and racism and how that has resulted in basically an explosive Tinder situation, no pun intended, that actually, you know, is part of what is behind so much of the violence that we are seeing. Yeah, so, I mean, I would argue that misogyny and male supremacy is as fundamental to far right movements as white supremacy. Um, you know, the when we look at the fascist ideology that underpins far right movements, we can see that they believe in this sort of fascistic notion of the natural order, which positions men as superior, women as inferior, white people as superior, black and minority ethnic people as inferior, and LGBTQ plus people just don't exist in the natural order at all. And that really positions women, as I say, as inferior to men and subordinate to men. And so a woman's role is pinned to the kind of reproductive role the, to, to, to kind of constantly be in service to, to male supremacy and to patriarchal authority. And this is why the far right is really hung up on, you know, banning abortion, because it wants to see women as pinned to a reproductive role and to for women to be having a purpose in defeating great replacement that is like solely reproductive to to create the next generation of white babies for the nation and for the race. So that's really important. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about far right misogyny is that it kind of plays a game in that it pretends to be really pro women and it pretends to be like, we're actually here to look after women. And this happens in sort of two ways. The first is we get this kind of idea of the white goddess in, in far right thinking. So that, you know, if you'd be, if you join the far right as a woman, we just will adore you. We'll, we'll, we'll worship you as the white goddess because of your fertile body and your innate ability to help us defeat great replacement. And this was kind of symbolized by the trad wife influencer, Ayla Stewart and her white baby challenge, where she said, you know, my, I, if I've had six white babies, can anyone beat me? And even like her name, wife with a purpose, like being on the far right gave her a purpose and her purpose was inherent in her body. But of course, if you're only a body, if your only purpose is reproductive and in, to, you know, put your body in service to like patriarchal authority and, and whiteness, then you can just be degraded as a body, right? You don't have any worth beyond your body. You're not fully human and you don't have any control over your fertility or your sexuality or, you know, your life generally. So it's kind of just real like tempting offer that you'll be adored and revered and we'll, we'll you know, treat you as as a, a goddess but it's like we'll put you on a pedestal and then we'll kick that pedestal down there's actually a reader version of that in my book but I'll just stick to the PG <laughs> well this is a perfect um, place to remind yeah. people to go out and purchase bodies under siege because that yeah. helps writers like you continue yeah. to do your work I have another question but then I was just I wanted to say as well like the other side of it and this is kind of more relevant like potentially relevant to the riots is you know the far right goes out and says that we are the protectors of women and that we, um, you know, the reason we're rioting is because these these 
brown men, these Muslim men, these black men are attacking our women, our girls, and we have to be the ones who protect them. But that completely, A, ignores the fact that white men are equally as culpable of men's violence against women as men of any other race. And it also ignores that the far right's project is to, like the political project, is to strip away protections for gender-based violence. So if you look at Trump, if you look at Putin, if you look at Vox in Spain, this is what they go out and say, that, you know, that there's massive issues around sexual exploitation and sexual abuse and domestic abuse within the far right. And that the very kind of model of far right relationships where women are seen as inferior and subordinate to male authority normalizes and allows for domestic abuse. So they kind of present themselves as like, we are here to protect you and we're, we are, you know, the, we are saving you from these other, you know, men who are going to harm you. But as the writer Helen Lewis put it, it's like when the far right says these immigrants coming over here, raping our women, the unbroken COVID, and that's our job. I have another question um, that I want to wrap this up with, but high fidelity, anything that you would like to ask before we let our friend go back to the sweltering heat in the United Kingdom? So we, we talk about the network uh, nature of this threat that we face. And one of the things I find is useful um, with examining networks and showing where the links are and who's behind these things is uh, a lot of money, right? And it turns out that uh, one of the main figures in the UK far right, a fellow who goes by Tommy Robinson, um, there is a lot of crypto flowing to him, which we know is, uh, you know, being used for all sorts of nefarious reasons. Um, there's also people who have financed his films who have ties back to Silicon Valley oligarchs. Um, do you feel that perhaps some sort of international treaty needs to be agreed to uh, by internet connected countries on how the internet could be utilized uh, to cause this chaos that we're seeing. And before you answer that, I just want to say my friend Wes Clark Jr., who's a really brilliant environmental activist and writer, says that it, he marvels that in the West, we've given hostile nations direct access to the minds of our citizens. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it does seem like there does need to be more international cooperation and understanding that this kind of money, this kind of influence crosses borders. Um, one of the things I always think is really interesting is there's kind of a stereotype in that, you know, far right influences are just sad losers living in their mum's basement when actually they're really, really wealthy <laughs> because they are drawing in all of this cash from various supporters. Um, but I think it goes back to what we were saying about the sort of inability of governments to grab hold of this issue and to understand what it actually looks like, you know, still thinking in these very old fashioned ways about how political groups or far right groups organize, rather than recognizing that this is about international cooperation, international influence, and people, you know, not being confined to that back room in a pub, but getting funding from the states, getting funding from other places, um, and so, yeah, I don't know if in, what, in, if international treaties are the answer, but international cooperation and a real acceleration in understanding what the threat is, is really needed. Uh, you just, you both just made me think about, uh, I've been trying to find a headline for a theme I'm about to write today where I basically curate the best of my, you know, uh, Roligarch reporting the tech fascists reporting techno fascists and it's really about tech pollution when I was doing a ton of reporting on global warming for Al Jazeera America. Um, I just remember, you know, somebody laughing at me like you know pollution doesn't just stay contained to a 40 mile radius, you know what I mean. There's no borders on pollution and you just gave me that concept of, of tech pollution because 
that really is it there there aren't any borders on this of course in russia they're trying to lock down what people can access and in north korea but for the rest of the world what do you do when your freedoms are continually weaponized against you i just want to say a couple things one is that my friends at Betty Dangerous know that this brilliant woman that you're hearing from today, Sean Norris, is the reason I came out of semi-retirement to do investigative reporting full time again. And it's because working with her on all of the stories we did to warn people about the overturning of Roe years in advance, um, you know, really just, uh, you just inspire me so much and true. One of the things that we uncovered in doing those stories, or certainly I uncovered it, Sean may have already known it, but I didn't, was back in the 1800s, the reason that there became this uh, movement against abortion was rooted in racism. Certainly the people who have access to better medical care or to abortion as decades wore on were the wealthier, which happened to be the whiter. And so racism was always baked into the mix. And I'm very glad you gave that response so people can understand it. My last question is kind of what Hi-Fi was alluding to, and that is that long screwdriver that we've talked about where, you know, what it's apparently a military term, what my friend Keir Giles says, Russia goes in when we have our, our crises or our self-inflicted problems that we never resolve and with a long screwdriver cranks up the volume. Have you seen in the recent rash of violence occurring in the United Kingdom, that long screwdriver influence or some of the characters that have been affiliated with Russia and Russian oligarchs are certainly like in America, obvious Putinists doing pro-Kremlin propaganda involving themselves in this violent rhetoric. Yeah, for sure. So at the beginning of the riots, there was some suggestion that the initial piece of disinformation had come from Russia. I think that's been fairly well debunked now. Um, and I'm always quite cautious of putting the blame of inciting disinformation on Russia as I mean, I, you know, racist British people are racist British people and they are racist without Russia's help. Um, and I think sometimes um, people can get a little bit like oh like it's, it must all be Russia and, and not look at the fact that we have our own problems in terms of racism and a rising far right um, and that we need to take responsibility for that but obviously we know as you say that when bad stuff happens Russian disinformation becomes part of the picture and that is kind of Russian bots and Russian influence goes into the overdrive and starts helping to amplify disinformation and various hateful um ideas and i think as well like we've just seen i mean i don't know about anyone else but like m my mentions have been an absolute trash fire and a lot of it just seems to be americans like <laughs> just like americans telling me what to think about my own country which i we always love in Britain. I apologize but I also, in advance. I apologize. But I also think, you know, we know that that is linked to the kind of Putin influence on the American right. We also know that there's, you know, Russian disinformation influence on the British left. Yeah. So the kind of red-brown alliance has been yeah. coming out of the woodwork in the wake of these riots as well. So I think, you know, we need to be really alert to how information is being manipulated who is kind of funding or supporting or disseminating this disinformation and we know as well that you know Nigel Farage the um, Reform UK MP he really sticks in my craw that he's an MP now on the eighth time of trying um, we know that he's praised Putin in the past he's always again been very careful about caveating that praise but you yeah. know he he's he's sort of made positive remarks about the Putin regime. Okay. You know, Tommy Robinson does the same. My own research on groups like Patriotic Alternative found like in the wake of the start of the full-scale invasion, these far-right groups were praising Putin because he was taking on a debauchery in the yeah. of the West, you know, the pro-anti-LGBT, anti-abortion groups saying that they wanted, yeah. you know, that they, they praised Putin. So there is definitely a crossover between Putin supporters Russian influence and what the hell is going on but yeah what I always find really funny is when Americans just assume I'm American because and they're just like talking to me about like how I vote Democrat and stuff I'm just like I don't live in your country <laughs> like, it's, like, it's, 
I mean, as we know, we're behind enemy lines on X Twitter. It's so clear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you try to search an old thread, it used to come up with a couple key words. Now you have to go through a shit stream of fascism until you find your old thread. It is so disgusting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to apologize in advance for the culture wars that have bled over into the UK because it's like we have polluted your country with our stupid shit and I, I feel bad about that I don't know the British far right has a long I don't know, history. <laughs> okay that was the reason we had the battle of Cable Street in the 1930s <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, okay. they've been okay. around a minute so yeah. okay. <laughs> okay well okay well if it's if it's ramped up at all I still accept my apology um but I do um I do want to say that one of the things that you brought up that I think is very important for people to be aware of when we talk about this stuff, because you're so right, the events don't have to be pinned on the Kremlin, but the exploitation around yeah. the events, obviously, there's always this opportunity to, to stoke our chaos. And what happened in America that I think it's important to remind people of is Russia sent spies. And those spies yeah. were here to collect information and they found out that we have issues around racism and misogyny. And those two things, two things were weaponized in order to help throw the election to Trump and away from Clinton. And I look at that as the greatest crime in U.S. history and have written an entire mm -hmm. series about it. But I digress. I have gotten all the answers to all the things that I wished for high fidelities or anything that we didn't cover that's important. In your recent report uh, for Open Democracy, Great Replacement and Boogaloo, uh, the ideology driving the modern far right. Uh, when I read it, you know, it seems a lot of those things pertain as well to Americans. So could you just run down some of the big points about what Americans should look for uh, in their own far right to warn against these things? Particularly as we're lurching toward November. Thank you for that high five. Yeah, so, I mean, I work now as a senior investigative reporter at Open Democracy on the UK news team, but writing about UK far right is obviously really relevant to what's going on on the US far right, because as I say, this isn't an, an autonomous movement, this is a networked movement that is international in scope and international in what it shares. So in the article, you know, I talked about this found like central ideology, this Great Replacement Ideology, White Genocide, how the far right in the US and the UK and in, in all sort of countries in Europe are moving around this central belief of replacement and genocide. And that that is kind of the response of the modern far right to that ideology or to that central conspiracy theory is the need for a war, a civil war that will be triggered by day X or the coming storm or boogaloo. That's the kind of code words that we see particularly on um, social media platforms like Gab um, where they talk about this civil war moment and it's really important to understand this because I think when we look at the US perspective 6th of January that was for many people what they expected to be day x that the desired outcome of that was to trigger a civil war around race lines that would ultimately lead to pure ethno states so forced deportation, um, forced repatriation, or, you know, a race-based genocide. Um, and I think when we understand that the reason why the global far right is talking about white genocide all the time is because they want to enact a genocide of their own, that's when we can sort of understand the sarcastic violence, the symbolic violence, the the reasons why we keep seeing this rhetoric online about civil war being inevitable, civil war, civil war, there'll be a civil war, because that's ultimately what they want. And I wrote in the piece how when we saw that footage in Britain of um, the men being pulled out of taxis and with the like people going, kill them, kill them. These are men who are rehearsing that their fantasy, they're rehearsing their fantasy of genocide. And we saw that on the 6th of January you know, we saw that kind of fantasy of genocide, fantasy of war being played out. And so really what I wanted in that article to explore is that whether you're in the UK, whether you're in the US, whether you're in Poland or New Zealand, the far right has a shared ideology 
a shared solution and a shared goal and none of it is pretty which is exactly why trump must be defeated and ukraine must win for everything that you just stated i'm, I'm yes exactly right yes it, it's so important that we never lose sight of you know the the bigger goals that we have which is to stop this lurching toward authoritarianism globally and reverse it back to democratic governance and maybe democratic governance isn't sexy but boy oh boy is it much better for the the planet the you know the children the cats you know the animals everything so sean thank you I so have much to say go, it go has, for it you know obviously i'm on the left and i'm a labor voter but it is nice having a socially democratic government in charge, <laughs> even when there's riots. I really hope that we come back in November and we do a victory lap here with you as well, because uh, the choices could not be more stark when Trump talks about, you know, deporting uh, 15 million people. What he's talking about is a genocide. So we do not take any of this stuff lightly. And I just thank you so much for your work. I am so much um, better educated on what is happening and the why of it. And uh, we just hope you come back soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.